Now, um, let's start with uh, another area that of the climate action pathway. Um, this is the beginning of session two, which is on producing food, energy, and infrastructure. And in this session and around these hot topics, we will discover some of the additional key elements of the water climate action pathway to reaching a net zero carbon emission future. For those who have just joined us, I am Maggie White, international, um, the Senior Manager for International Policy at CUE, and your MC here will, and in that capacity, would like to share with you just a few housekeeping elements. Um, the event is recorded, live streamed on YouTube. The Zoom platform that you are on right now would run continuously throughout the day. And we really, really hope that you do engage with us uh, um, via social media, through the CWE, IUCN, AGWA, CDP, and UN Global Compact Twitter handles. And don't forget the hashtag Race to Zero. I'm very happy that we're able to offer you French and Spanish interpretation also. Um, and just use the, um, the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you'd like to switch to another language. Now for this session on producing food, energy, and infrastructure, we actually have three high-level speakers uh, that will be joining us. And then again, three parallel breakout sessions that you have the opportunity to, to join and to choose from. And the links will be posted again in the chat box. And after that, we will reconvene um, on this platform for another very exciting Q&A and Mentimeter session that will be uh, managed by my colleague, Daniela Lolario. Now, in wanting to lay the scene when it comes to water resilient solutions in relation to producing food, energy, and infrastructure, I would like to welcome Etherian Cousin, who is a visiting scholar at the Center on Food Security and the Environment at Stanford University and former executive director of the World Food Program. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much and good morning to the CWE family and I'm so honored to be a part of today's Race to Zero. And it's not just today, it is the work that we must continue to perform together to ensure that we address the issues of food security as well as water and energy security. The industrial, our industrial agriculture system globally has never been more productive more efficient, and some would even say more effective. But the reality is, it is not sustainable, it's not, nor is it agile. And the challenge is that the water communities, the food community, and the energy community, we all work in silos when all of our issues are interconnected. The resolution of the water issues as was just described for cities is directly related to the resolution of water solutions as it, as it relates to agriculture and a more sustainable and productive agriculture. And so our challenge and what I am hoping that as I leave you leave with you here today is the challenge of recognizing that it's not wash or agriculture, it is both. That we must re remember that today, the in, in fact, fuel for tractors, transport and energy for fertilizer and other agricultural import, input production accounts for 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, that our food system accounts for approximately 70% of the clean water draws annually. Meat production alone uses 25% of all clean water on an annual basis. Food security defined by the three pillars of food availability, food accessibility, including affordability, and food absorption, and absorption is also, of course, consumption require, and uh, consumption, as we know, requires an adequate food digestion, which in turn requires access to clean water and sanitation. It's all connected. And today they're all under stress. Each of those systems are under, under stress. 2.4 billion people live with chronic, chronic water stress more than one third of the global population and 690 million suffer from chronic hunger. And before COVID, some 135 million suffered from acute severe 
food insecurity. And now with COVID, that number has doubled. And rising incomes have resulted in an increased demand for livestock and other nutrient dense foods, including fruits and vegetables, which require more predictable sources of water. Total agricultural food production must increase, some would suggest by 50% by the year 2050 to meet the food nourishment demand of a, po of a population projected to, <clears throat> to become nine and a half to 10 billion people. And if we continue to produce our agriculture the way we do, what that will mean is a global demand for water that is expected to increase 30 to 50% for agricultural production. And because it's driven largely by that increased demand for agricultural production. And at the same time, just today, as we sit here, pollution and lack of infrastructure leave more than 880 million people without clean water access near their homes. And let's not forget that an estimated 1.3 billion tons of food is, <laughs> or one third of the global food supply is lost or wasted each year. This food loss wastes energy, water, and nutrition produced by the world's farmers. The challenges of water security and food security are not isolated to the poor and vulnerable or only to developing countries. Right here at home in the United States, we've experienced more acute and frequent floodings in the Midwest due to droughts and climate affected green water reductions. In, in, and in the West, water access and stresses create ever more water security challenges directly related to our production, particularly of produce. So, and we can't, we, some would suggest that the solution to our sustainable food, our sustainable energy uh, problems are, are the increasing biofuels. But we know that approximately today, 40% of US corn is used to produce ethanol. And that agricultural production of soy and corn raises issues, additional issues of sustainability. <clears throat> because then we're, again, we're using petroleum-based fertilizer. Those monocrops have increased water consumption and we have the impact of monocropping on soil, de soil degradation. So creating of sustainable food, water, Secure and water, food and water security, as well as an, and an equitable access to sustainable energy across all three of these issues requires working together, requires moving beyond our siloed of, of past, recognizing the blind spots inherent in single issue solutions, which fail to consider and compensate for all the externalities of each of these silos. The nexus and climate change present yet an untapped opportunity <clears throat> that the advancements in data sciences can unlock to address these challenges. The ability to turn data into actionable insights and, better, and a better food system management is within our grasp. The academic activists and policy communities agree the way forward will require ag tech, food tech and innovation, but we're challenged in agreeing upon what those solutions mean today for across all three of the subject areas. And we know we must create, it's not just about the technology, it's about also creating an enabling environment to support, support the growth of enterprises that can ensure the necessary financial return and multifaceted sustainable in, impact. And that policy in, environment, we must create the global policy templates supporting national policy management <clears throat> between all three of the sectors with local shared implementation plans. With that policy framework, then technical, technical, techno, techno, technological advances, and uh, uh, we will have the critical 
platforms to address the nexus of the challenges between our food, water, and energy systems, creating a more equal and more sustainable food system is not a choice. It's not a choice with our water systems. The food, the future of food, water, and energy is the future narrative of our humanity. Thank you. Therian, thank you so much. And I know it's very early in Chicago for you right now. And you have just shaken us up with so much passion and very, very eloquently show that interconnectedness that we have between water, food, and energy. And one cannot be submissive to the other. They all have to work together and share each other. And it's in looking at that interconnectedness that we can address not only the trade-offs, but also the co-benefits that we can have and, and that the importance of that cooperation. And you used to work for the World Food Program, but I also would like to remember here that uh, this year, the Nobel Peace Prize went to FAO. Um, and I think that's also something that we need, to, sorry, the World Food Program to your organization. And we also need to remember that it's, it's not only about big conflicts, it's also about local conflicts. A lot of the conflicts in the world, that is where it's happening and very much related to border and food security issues. So thank you so much for putting this on the table and allowing me now to go towards Mechtild Woodsdorfer, who is the Director on Sustainability, Technology and Outlooks at the International Energy Agency, and who previously has held several senior positions at the European Commission to bring in the energy perspective. Thank you, over to you. Thank you very much, Maggie, and thank you very much for inviting me for that important water day and the discussions uh, so far. And uh, I'm delighted to join you here from Paris. It's lunchtime, so it's uh, a bit easier for me uh, during the day. And I will concentrate on the water energy nexus, but I was also delighted to hear from Etherin just before me that it's a much more complex. There are a lot of interaction, not only between water and energy, but there's agriculture and other sector. So what you are looking in today, uh, all these interactions and uh, interrelations is, is quite important. So the International Energy Agency is based in Paris. Um, we are working as a global energy organization and I have a few slides to share and I think you, are, you will set up the slides uh, for me. So if you could eventually start, I have uh, six slides. Mechtild, I'm very sorry, I didn't receive the slides. So if you have them on your laptop, um, please do go ahead and share your screen with us. Okay, then I need a few minutes. I was told that you had got them, um, but let me find them on my Wonderful, screen. thank you, Mechtild. Right now. Wonderful, we see them, thank you. Okay, do you see them in full? Not yet, so you have to go to presenter mode, exactly, wonderful. Okay, sorry for that. So uh, I will say a few words um, today about the impact of the COVID on energy demand and greenhouse gas emissions. Then uh, I will underline what are the sustainable pathways uh, to go to net zero and the International Energy Agency has done multiple scenarios, but there are a couple of things we need to take into account because often we think about net zero uh, pathways that we are only looking at the future, the new power plants, the new things. But we have done also some analysis and it's, um, it will be shown very briefly that a lot of emissions right now and uh, are coming from existing infrastructure, from existing power plants, from existing uh, uh, work uh, and, and, and uh, things we are doing. So we are looking at 
in the agency uh, on the energy transformation, not only in the power sector, but also industry and building. And in order to get to net zero by 2050, it's very clear uh, we need to get everyone on board. We speak about our governments, but also companies, citizens. It's really a joint effort. And in the clean energy transition, we can see even an increased linkage between energy and water. And in order to uh, make it a joint exercise and a success story, it needs to be really properly managed. So uh, because a low, low energy pathway, a transition to a low carbon economy, that can also put stress on water and uh, if it's not managed well. So in order to, I will show the linkages, climate, energy, water needs to be properly managed that we all get the benefits from it uh, from a climate and economic point of view. Just a, a short uh, background. Uh, we all experience a very special year from an economic health point of view, but also from the energy sector. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has year by year, and our estimates are for 2020, that energy demand will go down by nearly 6%, that's oil, gas, and coal, and to a lesser extent, there's some good news, for example, that renewables are uh, more resistant to uh, uh, the pandemic, and they are doing uh, slightly better than others. But also investments are going down in energy uh, to nearly 18% this year. And as we can see, as a matter of fact, uh, we see a drop in CO2 emission expected to be by minus 7% worldwide by the end of this year. So this hasn't been seen uh, since World War II. So it's, it's linked obviously to what I said before, energy demand going down, transport is really uh, airplanes and others uh, where oil is mainly used is going down. And that is a temporary thing. What I want to underline here that we need structural changes to cut emissions and we need to put our sustainable recovery plans high on the agenda and include clean energy transitions in these recovery plans to make this drop in CO2 emission a permanent peak in 2019 and 2020 and not and learn from lessons uh, before that there is no rebound of emissions. So this is really very, very important. When we look at our scenarios, the World Energy Outlook came out a few weeks ago. Um, we have a standard scenario uh, uh, where we see, which is called step stated policy scenario, where we see a plateauing of emissions um, over the next decades. But we also have a sustainable development scenario, which brings us to net zero by 2070. That is basically uh, using energy efficiency and material efficiency to its full uh, deployment, uh, much more of renewables and all other technologies. And as you can see, a number of governments have already pledged net zero more recently, China, Japan, Korea, but this is not enough. And we have done first time in this year's World Energy Outlook, a new scenario, which is called net zero by 2050. And that means we need even go beyond and have much more dramatic investments in technologies, in buildings, but we include also behavioral change. And now let me come, why is that so important? The clean energy transitions and the, way, uh, the water and the climate change priorities. We have done a special report on world, uh, water energy nexus in the World Energy Outlook in 2017, and we have updated it since. So this is analysis uh, quite recent, but pre-COVID, where you on one side see energy sectors, water consumption 2014 and the preview for 2040, which is seeing uh, increased water consumption which is underpinned by more increase in biofuels production, in, in nuclear power, but also there is a shift to advanced cooling technology in thermal power plants, 
that withdraw less water, but that consume more water. So this is going in the direction of more water use for energy. The same is true if we speak about water sector energy consumption. The need for water gets more energy intensive. So we can see, as you see here, by 2040, global energy use in the water sector more than doubles. And this is mainly due to desalination, water transfer, and more demand for wastewater treatment. The good news here is that there is also a huge untapped potential for energy savings in the global water sector. And that with what we need to focus on. We need to look and how to reduce leaks, increase efficiency of water waste uh, treatment and energy recovery. And let me go to something which was discussed uh, during the day already how climate change impacts water and energy security. We have done um, some work here and also some regional work, like we have done a, a, a report on climate impacts on African hydropower capacity factor, where you can see there are different scenario depending if you're in Morocco, West Africa, Congo, or in the Nile Basin, where we see the climate impacts going uh, ahead. But as I said in the beginning, the key issue here is that we need to manage that energy water linkage in a way that it can cope with climate impacts and enhance resilience. And there are many ways of that, how can that be felt through water and energy and how we can um, have solutions here around uh, looking at new technology applications, uh, more efficiency, and uh, look at this interaction. So let me conclude. While we know there is no single pathway to a zero calm future, the water and energy way is one thing we have to look and uh, be integrated in our transition strategy. That is a very critical factor and that is not done enough. So the day to day and giving all that discussions around how to do it is absolutely welcome and needed. We need to diminish the water resources and that can lead to greater reliance, reliance on energy intensive sources of water supply, why water scarcity can impact energy production. And we saw that in, in India, that uh, they have lost 14 terawatt hours of thermal power generation two years ago due to water shortages. So they couldn't produce as much so we have to have a coordinated action on our sustainable goals. And we need to look at current and future water availability to take into account. We need to look at leakages to use water more efficiently. And we need to do at new technology. And that all together, we are working with different organizations around the world and happy to interact more. My colleague is staying for the rest of the breakthrough, uh, the breakout sessions to go into much deeper what can be done to help this energy water nexus to be on the positive side as we go ahead. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mechtil, so much for sharing that with us. And um, I think we're really moving well along. Uh, we often say that um, water is for adaptation, what energy is for mitigation, but actually that's a very sectorial divided view of looking at things. And uh, both you and Irvin have really highlighted the interconnectedness and the importance of that. And through water, we can actually address adaptation and mitigation um, solutions also. So thank you for bringing that to the table. And I would now like to uh, allow us to listen to Jennifer Morris, who is a chief executive officer at the Nature Conservation Conservation, conservancy with over 25 years of experience in protecting the environment for people and nature. Let's listen to Jennifer. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Morris, the CEO of the Nature Conservancy. 25 years ago, I started my career as a volunteer, living in Northern Namibia, working with a local women's organization. And during those two years in Namibia, I learned the interconnectedness of a healthy ecosystem and access to critical water. Living in this community, one of our tasks was to dig deep boreholes in the hard ground 
to try and find water from the aquifer. This is especially difficult during the years that I was there as it was during a period of prolonged drought exacerbated by climate change and deforestation. But water in that region wasn't always so difficult to find. My friend Ria had shown me pictures of her home 25 years prior, filled with lush trees that had since been removed for precious, essential firewood. Nearly three decades later, impacts from the climate emergency continue to reshape our world and stress the natural systems that support access to fresh water. Today, 40% of source watershed areas show significant land degradation, which is changing water flow patterns across landscapes, just like it did for my friend Rhea in northern Namibia. Half of the world's population already lives in water scarce places, a figure that will increase as populations grow and climate change continues to impact our shared planet. As we think about how to address these challenges, one thing is clear. The path to water security is not exclusively paved in concrete. We need systems to deliver clean water that are more adaptive, more restorative, and more resilient. What we really need is more nature. When decision makers incorporate nature-based solutions to protect source waters, they can address downstream water security challenges and take active steps to address the climate emergency. And what's more, at least for decision makers with a balance sheet to consider, this type of green infrastructure can be very cost effective. For example, in Cape Town, which was dangerously close to running out of water in 2018, investments in invasive tree removal throughout the watershed are now helping to deliver significant water gains for the city at one-tenth of the cost of gray infrastructure interventions like desalinization and groundwater expansion. And this isn't an anomaly. TNC's research estimates that one out of six large cities can pay for nature-based solutions through savings in water treatment alone. One of the mechanisms we use to drive investment in nature-based solutions is water funds. These water funds organize downstream water users like cities, businesses and utilities to invest in upstream land management practices that protect water at the source. Activities including forest protection, reforestation, and improved agricultural practices work to promote water filtration, produce more reliable downstream flows, and deliver important co-benefits to biodiversity and local economies. The key to a successful water fund is collaboration. TNC has helped launch 41 water funds with our partners in farming, utilities, city management, corporations, and community groups from Cape Town, South Africa to China's Jingxing province. In Nairobi, Kenya, for example, agricultural expansion in the upper reaches of the Tana River, which supplies 95% of Nairobi's water supply and half the country's electricity, has led to increased soil erosion and decreased dry season water flows to the city. The Upper Tana Nairobi Water Fund, set up by TNC, the Nairobi Water and Sewer Company, local government, and other partners, is helping thousands of farmers adopt more sustainable farming practices that can address these challenges. So far, the initiative has helped reduce soil erosion during the rainy season by planting 3 million trees on farms and increasing vegetation along local riverbanks. Rainwater harvesting activities are also supporting farmer productivity and increasing Nairobi's water supply during the critical dry season. The very activities that help protect source water have also enormous potential for climate change mitigation. Reforestation efforts that are part of water funds in Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and Belo Horizonte are expected to sequester 2 million tons of CO2 in the next 10 years alone. One recent study found that fully implementing reforestation, forest protection, and agricultural best management practice across all source watersheds could deliver 16% of the 2050 emissions reduction goal set by the Paris Accord. The challenge now is taking this to scale. It's on all of us, a community, to champion and elevate the role of nature in source water protection around the world as a key tool for achieving water security. 
We must continue to make the case for nature-based solutions and provide the technical assistance, policy leadership, and financial mechanisms that will get more of these projects off the ground. With the right support, there is an enormous opportunity for local and national governments to move this work forward, to prioritize nature in their water infrastructure planning, and deliver multiple benefits to communities, biodiversity, and our precious climate. Ethereum, and Mechtild, and Jennifer, thank you so much for these inspiring insights and for laying the ground before we go into our breakout discussions. Those will be centered around one transformative solution that showcases the power of water in climate action. For the breakout sessions that are listed now in our chat box, you have the choice of going to session one, which will be presented by CUE's Africa Regional Center on building climate resilience through rain-fed agriculture. The breakout session number two will be led by WWF, and we'll look into how to keep rivers healthy with low cost, low carbon energy solutions. And the third breakout session is led by John Matthews from Agua, who present the fascinating story of climate bond standards and water infrastructure. Hello everyone, and welcome back from your breakout sessions. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. My name is Daniela Lerario, and I'm speaking from Sao Paulo. And I'm with the High Level Climate Champions team supporting the Water Day to Race to Zero November Dialogues. It is a pleasure to be here. Today, I'll be guiding you through the Q&A portion of the session, and we'll be trying out some creative ways to bring you back out of the deep dive conversations you just had in the breakout sessions and reorient you towards your own individual and organization's commitments and actions. To bring a bit of levity into the session and make sure we give enough time for people to reconnect, we have pre prepared some Mentimeter polls, polls for you uh, in the audience. For those of you who never joined or used Mentimeter, just go to www.menti.com and use the code 96538384. It's on the top of, of the slide and also on the chat. So the first question is, how many gigatons of carbon could be saved by changing the way we use water to grow rice? Nobody went from zero, that's good. So we have two, 14 and 110, only three people. Come on, how many gigatons of carbon could be saved by changing the way we use water to grow rice? For those, for those of you just joining now, we're coming back from the sessions. I'm Daniela Lerario, and please go to www.menti.com and use the code written on the top of the screen and on the chat. 96, 53, 83, 4, for a little bit of interaction. There you go. So 14 is the right answer, only by changing the way we use rice paddies. It's not always about being disruptive. Now, what proportion of global GHG emissions that does the use, storage, distribution, and treatment of water approximately account for? Welcome back everyone. For those of you who are joining now, I'm Daniela Leradio and we're going through a Mentimeter poll question to test your knowledge on the theme. So just go to www.menti.com and use the code 96538384 and, and give us your answer to what proportion of global GHG emissions does the use storage, distribution, and treatment of water approximately account for? Most of you saying 10%. 
Yes. And you're right. Uh, okay. So the next one is the answer to a water secure zero carbon future lie in green hydrogen, solar, hydropower, or nuclear. Let's see what you guys think of that. We have two for solar, three, <laughs> green hydrogen. Seven for solar, hydropower and green hydrogen are a tie. So great. Um, I guess most of you think that uh, a water secure zero carbon future lie in solar. So now agriculture consumes what volume of the world's fresh water? For those of you joining, just go to www.menti.com and use the code 96538384. Most of you with 75% and you are right. It's 75% of the world's fresh water. Okay, water consumption of low carbon energy production in 2030 will disappear completely, increase by 50% or decrease by 50%. Take your guess. I see someone saying disappear completely. <laughs> That's good. Increase by 50%. Yeah, so the challenge is to ensure that we transition in the nexus water energy in harmony, right? So we have another one in rural areas. How many of those who lack access to electricity also lack access to clean drinking water? None, two thirds, three quarters, or all. Two thirds, three quarters. And it's two thirds. Can you imagine not having access to electricity and drinking water? What would your life look like, right? Now, we have um, two Mentimeters that are currently open for you to answer. So. What concrete water actions do you or your organization have planned in the future that aligns with water climate action pathway? So for this one, please go to www.menti.com and use the code 96538384. We will love to hear your actions.
Microhydro 52 annually available. Very good. Pursuing policies and catalyzing investment in power systems that are both low carbon and low conflict with communities and natural resources. Low carbon pathways that are consistent with resilient communities and rivers. Devel develop off grip micro, micro head solutions. Sorry. IWA support for climate smart utilities, resources, capacity development, and community of practice. Thank you for the interactions. We look forward to seeing more and more in that Mentimeter. So now I'd like to invite, invite each of the breakout sessions spokes, spokesperson to take the floor and share with us in 45 sec seconds or less what solutions was presented and some of the key takeaways from your conversation. So for session two, producing food, energy, and infrastructure, uh, the transformative solution on agriculture and food, building climate resilience through rain-fed agriculture. I invite Shanani from Siwi Africa Regional Center to please read out our summary points. Thank you. And yes, our session was on uh, building climate resilience through enhancing rain-fed agriculture systems. And um, our main points were to explore how we can leverage climate financing for rain-fed agriculture. And one of the takeaways in this area is that um, projects needs to work at the national level, working with um, accredited agency that would help with the project preparation and also presenting this project at the funders like the GCF. And also we looked at other ways of attracting investments into this uh, rain-fed agriculture is to bundle it up with other components like um, land management, uh, catchment management, the jobs issues around river basins, because it, there's a tendency or it seems like a lot of people may not be interested in rain-fed agriculture or wanting to stay in practicing rain-fed agriculture, but then building, it, building this up around the jobs, around other benefits that are related. So coming up with a basket of how to address other issues are around livelihoods in the river basins is one of the important issues. Um, yes, I think I have um, summarized the main points that came out of our session. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so for our second transformative solution on energy, Keeping rivers healthy with low cost, low carbon energy solutions. Please, uh, Jeff of the World Wildlife Fund, I invite you to present your summary points to the, to the audience. Great, so we're focusing on the, this water energy nexus and thinking about water, not just in terms of, of volume of water, but water in the form of rivers and the benefits that rivers provide, um, including their food security benefits. And we discussed uh, visions for future energy pathways that are low carbon, low cost, and low conflict with communities and rivers. Um, the forecasted amount of hydropower to meet energy targets would result in the damming of the majority of remaining free flowing rivers and the benefits they provide to people, including fisheries and sediment that support deltas. So we explained how we've uh, done analyses that show how we can achieve uh, low cost, low carbon grids that avoid the kinds of hydropower that would have those impacts. Um, and then we had um, a case study from the Mekong illustrating that further. And we had uh, several respondents who uh, chimed in with their own examples of how this vision of a low conflict, low carbon uh, energy pathways are possible. Examples from Ghana and Australia and Cambodia, and also the tools and computational tools we can use to help decision makers identify those pathways. That's amazing. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and finally, to present our last breakout transformative solution for this session on infrastructure, unleashing climate finance for critical water infrastructure, green bonds and beyond. I uh, please Ingrid from Agua uh, and with Alliance for Global Water and Climate Bonds Institute. Uh, please Ingrid, could you read out some of the key takeaways from your conversation to us? 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Daniela. So we had a great conversation. Um, we heard, you know, we heard from the opening remarks um, by the high-level champions earlier in the day um, that water is really kind of this key systemic link for solving the climate crisis. Um, and so if we understand that water is that systemic link, then water infrastructure is really a vehicle through which uh, we, we will build a low carbon and resilient world. And so thus we need to ensure that water infrastructure, and by that of course I mean both gray and green infrastructure, right, is itself resilient. Um, and so we talked a lot about different financing options. Um, we know that finance is necessary to fund adaptation and mitigation, um, but finance instruments really need to include effective and transparent climate and water risk assessment um, as a condition for financing. Uh, this is because the long life of much infrastructure means that climate exposure is very high um, and existing and new infrastructure should be designed to be robust to known risks um, and opportunities, as well as flexible for uncertainty um, and potential risks and opportunities that we don't know about yet. Our economic analysis approaches for infrastructure resilience should be adjusted so that uh, the cost benefit analyses can accurately reinforce robust and flexible um, adaptation options. And so we, um, John gave a presentation then on, on one such uh, solution, which is the climate bond standard. Uh, we also heard from the OECD uh, that despite intense and growing uh, interest in nature-based solutions or NBS, like green infrastructure, most of the funding thus far has been directed towards pilot programs. And so we really need to be starting to move to scale. Uh, there are some challenges and barriers to that, but there's also a lot of opportunities. Um, like for example, adding uh, NBS to, to policy vehicles like uh, the NDCs and NAPs um, to help kind of mainstream at the national level. Um, and then we also heard from the ADB, the Asian Development Bank, um, about some of the work that they're doing uh, to make sure that their uh, water investments and, and that their clients' water investments um, are resilient. Um, they're working very hard to build country capacity, but there are still a lot of challenges um, related to kind of capturing uh, the adaptation additionality and benefits of projects. And then finally, we heard um, from the kind of project scale um, from Sarah Freeman, who is working uh, in Mexico City uh, to build water uh, and climate resilience uh, for, for their water infrastructure. Um, today, more than ever, we have the opportunity and obligation to address current development challenges while also ensuring solutions. We need to make sure that we do not expose, um, expose communities to additional long-term risks associated with climate. So with that, I will stop and hand it back to Daniela. Thank you, Ingrid. That's great. Some interesting messages coming through. So uh, I'd like to thank you all the presenters and partners and the audience for the great discussion. Siri Africa Regional Center. Thank you, Shanani, WWF and Jeff and uh, Agua and Climate Bonds Institute uh, with Ingrid. We need to ensure a zero carbon resilient future through water. Maggie, back to you.